Thriving in today's fast-paced world of change and disruption requires innovation. Inside Outside Innovation is the podcast that explores the ins and outs of innovation with raw stories, real insights, and practical advice from the best and brightest in the world of startups and innovation. Each week, we'll bring you the latest ideas in lean startup, design thinking, corporate venture capital, and more. Now, let's get started. So welcome to another episode of Inside Outside Innovation, the podcast where we take a look at corporate innovation and everything else going on in the world of uh, co-working, venture capital, and uh, startups and, and fun stuff like that. Today, we've got a great guest. Um, I'm very excited to talk to Liz Elam. She is uh, well-known in the co-working space. Uh, she's a Texas A&M grad, which us Nebraskans won't hold that against you. Um, you worked for Dell for 15 years as a global account manager. Uh, and then my understanding is you spent a lot of time on the road, and uh, through that, telecommuting and everything else, you said, hey, there's a need here for something uh, called co-working. And you uh, set out and in Austin put together uh, Link Co-working, and then secondly, in 2012, started Link 2, which is another co-working space. Um, my understanding is you also, I mean, you really have embraced this and, and really helped a lot of folks understand what are the ins and outs of co-working. And, you started the uh, Global Coworking Unconference, um, which is you know, worldly known, uh, and a couple other things that are coming up that I'll let you talk about in the in the future. Um, so, I guess to get started, you know, obviously in the world of coworking, what kind of role has coworking played in the rise of startups and innovation, and where do you see that role evolving in the future? Well, you know, as far as startup and innovation, I think that what it's done is it's taken people out of their homes and out of their garages. A lot of people think that the co-working's, you know, competitor, quote unquote, is another office or a coffee shop, but it's really not. The majority of our workers are coming from their home or, or in the startup world, often from their garage. So instead of being in this bubble by yourself, you're surrounded by other humans getting things done. And you're able to bounce ideas off of other people. You're able to hear about, you know, an innovation and an app that maybe you wouldn't have heard of if you were sitting in your home having a conversation with your cat. So I think that what it's really done is given a home to all of these people that are working independently. You know, people are choosing to work independently in droves like we never have before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the reasons we're all so, quote unquote, busy is because we have all these choices now. And, you know, working from home sounds super awesome at first until you actually get there and you realize <laughs> you're alone. Exactly. Exactly. So what, what are some of the, you've been early in the scene. So what are some of the things that you've seen kind of evolve um, from, again, I think a lot of people think of co-working as starting out with, as like freelancers. Um, kind of, you know, gathering together to, to talk and work in, in the same room. What kind of evolution have you seen uh, in the world of co-working? Wow, it's been absolutely amazing because, yeah, when I entered the market, there were probably a few hundred spaces in the world. Now it's growing so fast. Um, we don't think our numbers are totally valid, but we think it's over 10,000 spaces in the world. And, you know, they are just, the, the growth has been phenomenal. So when I opened my space in Austin, there were four other spaces that could be considered co-working. Um, of those four, two are left, but another 32 have entered the market. Wow. Yeah. Um, and that's just in little old Austin, Texas, where we have two million people. Go look at a London or a Shanghai or a Hong Kong or a Sydney, and it's out of control. The density and the um, the amount of co-working spaces is just, the, the growth is phenomenal. And then along with that growth comes, you know, the rise of a behemoth. And in this industry, that's WeWork. Mm -hmm. And, you know, WeWork has really done a good job. Their reach is unbelievable. Their growth is phenomenal. They're very well funded. And now we're also starting to see some more kind of franchise models. We've got Industrious on the heels of WeWork. And, there's a lot of up and coming brands right now. Lots of specialization is happening as would as it would in any trend. So, you know, is there co working spaces for lawyers? Yep. <laughs> is there co working spaces for knitters? Yep. 
Are there co-working spaces for fashion designers? Yep. So there is a lot of specialization as well. And then I think, you know, the other thing that's interesting is we're, we're seeing a lot of um, chatter and enthusiasm right now is from corporate America. Mm -hmm. You know, they know that they have a disengaged workforce. They know they need to pivot. They know they need to innovate. They know they need to be more like entrepreneurs and less like corporations. And they're looking to co co-working to solve a lot of their problems. So talk to me a little bit more about that. How do you see uh, corporations engaging with co-working spaces? Are they just giving uh, their employees access to these spaces? Are they creating their own? What are you seeing? A little bit of all of that. Um, they're definitely sending people into the co-working spaces, which is awesome. But it's interesting because we usually have to kind of train people how to act in a co-working space <laughs> if they come from a corporation. Um, and then, so so un are, unpack that a little bit. So tell me a little bit about yeah. how how what are the differences that you're seeing in the in the coworkers themselves? That they need to learn that it's okay to talk to other people. They need to learn that they are in a shared environment and that they can't come take over a particular part of the space, that they actually need to integrate into the space. Mm. I think they're so used to having, you know, this is my desk and this is where I live and I'm going to put all my stuff here and quote unquote unpack. Well, you know, in an open co-working space where we all share the same space, you don't get to own a particular space unless you're paying for a dedicated desk or an office. Mm -hmm. So they, they have to be taught kind of how to play well with others. What are some of the, the kind of forward-thinking corporations doing uh, with with regard to that? Again, are that, do they, what are some best practices, I guess, if you're a corporation saying, hey, we know we need to embrace some of this co-working, what are some of the things we should be thinking about? Right. Well, the, I think the first thing they should do is go educate themselves, and they're doing that. Um, you know, of course, I don't think it's surprising at all that, you know, one of the industries that's really looking at this very thoroughly is the corporate real estate industry. You know, they're freaking out because they have all this space and they don't have people to occupy it, so they're looking at co-working to solve their problem. Well, then they start looking at co-working and they think, oh, well, this is great. We'll put in some fancy furniture and we'll call it co-working and that's how we'll fill up this space. And it's so much more than that. If it were that easy, it, this this would we'd have a million spaces, not ten thousand. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of moving parts because you know we're in the hospitality and happiness industry, and sure it looks pretty simple from the outside, but it's very complex because you're dealing with humans, mm -hmm. and humans have needs, and humans have wants, and humans have things that they think they must have, and you're trying to change some of that behavior, get them to integrate and converse and build a community. And that's the thing that's so hard for corporations and companies like Regis to understand is that it's about community. That's it's, why we've seen this amazing, unique growth. Yeah, it's more than just the space. It's it's about the programming and the training and the and the collisions that happen in that space as much as the space itself. Yeah, we like to call it accelerated serendipity. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about, again, the, the evolution. Uh, again, it mm -hmm. used to be where uh, you know people got together and worked in the same space, but then you saw, I think you saw the, the better co-working spaces adding in, uh, you know, training or programs or workshops or academies and other ways that to get uh, smart uh, people together learning and, and, mm -hmm. and, and working together. So talk a little bit about that and some of the things you're seeing there. Yeah, we are seeing, you know, a lot of evolution as far as programming and also seeing companies branch out of co-working spaces and, you know, just do training programs or just do events and event spaces are actually very much on the rise. We've also seen co-living kind of branch out of co-working and also this huge rise of the digital nomad. And you know what? When you're traveling around the world, you need some place to work. Where do you go work? If you're a digital nomad, you go to a co-working space. Mm -hmm. So so there are a lot of periphery things happening around co-working. And, you know, there there are a lot of innovations still to come. There's just there's basically an endless supply of people that need space to get things done. So, you know, one of the things that we really kind of preach as an industry is that you're not a competitor, you're a collaborator with mm -hmm. the other people in your industry and in your town. Because there's plenty for, for everybody. 
So talk a little bit about some of the, the changes in the, the technologies and the tools that you're seeing in the co-working space. That's actually a really great question and, and very interesting. As an operator who started out six years ago, and I now have actually three spaces, I opened my third space um, this month. Congrats. Is, thank you. Um, is it, you know, in the beginning, there, there was, I think, one operator making software for co-working. And we just held Juicy, which is um, the Global Co-working Unconference Conference, we just call it Juicy for short, in LA in May. And I think we had eight or 10 different companies there that are creating software and, and sometimes hardware as well, just yeah. for the co-working industry. And that, that area is on fire because there are so many innovations that could help people to connect and build community and hire each other and work together and create things together. And one of the things we need are better tools to do that. So in the, go ahead. Sorry. In the past, there were very few options and they weren't awesome. And now we have a lot of really amazing products um, coming on board. It, it's, it's interesting because I've, I've seen that as well. And it, some of the things that we're seeing, it's becoming more um, about like almost collaborative spaces, uh, a network of collaborative spaces. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing these co-working uh, groups kind of come together. So if you are yeah. uh, in another city, you can access their people, their, their spaces as well. So talk a little bit about how you're seeing it move from a local kind of environment to more of a global environment. Yeah, well, that, that is interesting. I was one of the founding members of the League of Extraordinary Coworking Spaces, which we call Lexi. <laughs> and um, Lexi allows you to travel with your coworking membership. So if you're a member of Link in Austin, Texas, you can go to Bureau in Miami and work there. You can go to Grind in New York City. You can go to Link Spaces in LA. You can go to Common Desk in Dallas. So there's the Lexi network. There's also a like a worldwide co-working visa program, and Lexi has also recently gone global. And then you know one of the things that I'm seeing in the software that's coming to the market is um, people are connecting through apps mm -hmm. and sharing information through apps. And I think some interesting things I think will happen down the line as well with like some beacon technology. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you know that they're there are, of course, the face-to-face -face connections, but I think there's even a bigger connection coming through software. Amazing. So, can you talk a little bit about? So, if I'm a, if I'm if I'm in the market for a, a co-working space, what are some of the things I should be looking for, of picking and choosing the best ones? Yeah, I think you know the first thing you should do is do a Google search, and you know then go visit a bunch of websites, see which ones you want to go visit that makes sense for your commute, and then. And, you know, go to all of them. It's just like the different flavors of ice cream, you know, try not to figure out which one you want. And a lot of spaces offer a first day for free, so you can check it out before you sign on the dotted line, and that's a really good way to, to get a feel for the space and see if it, it fits you. And, you know, I think the thing is, is, you know, oftentimes people are you know worried about turning somebody down but I think the thing is is if somebody doesn't fit in your space or if they're clearly not jiving in your space you can help them find the right space you know if you come into link co-working and you're like look I want to get connected to VCs I'm gonna launch this product I want demo days and hackathons I'm gonna send you someone somewhere else hmm. because that's not our vibe that's not our energy that's not what we're doing but both Tech Ranch and Capital Factory and possibly WeWork have some of those things. Mm -hmm. And that's where you should go. So, you know, there's different spaces with different flavors and different attitudes and different programming. And just, you know, go try some out and figure out what the best one is for you. That's great advice. Um, I think the last thing I want to talk about is, you know, you mentioned your, your um, global conference and that. I know mm -hmm. you, you have another one coming up here in China. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, you know, as co-working has exploded, um, the conference series that I run has as well. So we started out um, five years ago kind of as a follow-on to some South by Southwest programming, and we had a little half-day unconference here in Austin in 2011. 
And then in 2012, we had the first conference here in Austin. Now we moved the conference around. It was just in LA, but last year, we held conferences in Sydney, in Shanghai, in Toronto, and um, this year we've already done San Paulo in LA, and we are going to Beijing in September, where we're expecting probably over a thousand attendees. Amazing. That sounds great. Well, I appreciate you being uh, on our podcast and telling a little bit about some of the innovations you're seeing in the co-working space. If uh, some of our audience wants to get a hold of you or, or find out more and, and keep in touch with what's going on, uh, what's the best way to kind of reach out or, or stay connected? Yeah, there's a couple of different ways because I run a couple of different things. Um, you can always email me lit at liz at linkcoworking.com or liz at gcuc.co. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for being on Inside Outside Innovation and uh, looking forward to staying connected. Thanks very much for being on the show. Well, that's it for another episode of Inside Outside Innovation. Special thanks to our guests for being on the show this week. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so please do reach out and uh, talk to us on Twitter at the IO Podcast. Uh, visit us online at, at uh, insideoutside.io. And uh, if you have 30 seconds, go over to iTunes, uh, leave a review, and you can subscribe there as well. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, go out and innovate.